Nancy Brophy loved writing about unsuitable men, about heroes breaking into the lives of ordinary women and dragging them into the world of intrigues, adventures, and passion. The 68-year-old author and self-publisher of romance novels lived with her husband, chef Daniel Brophy. The stories which Nancy wrote added a pinch of danger and adrenaline to her peaceful and calm life. According to the novelist herself, their blue house in Beaverton community near Portland, Oregon, was filled with food, love, and chickens walking in the backyard. However, below the surface of this idyllic life, something disgusting was arising and simmering. On June 2, 2018, students of the Oregon Culinary Institute, who came to the next class, found their 63-year-old instructor Daniel Brophy lying on the kitchen floor with no signs of life. On arrival at the campus, a medical team pronounced him dead. The story of the murder of Dan Brophy drew the attention of not only Portland dwellers, but also of the entire United States. As prosecutors and the press were revealing more and more information about this case, a storyline worthy of a detective novel was appearing. As the old English saying goes, truth is stranger than fiction. And from that moment on, lawyers, friends and family of the famous Portland chef faced the problem of distinguishing one from the other. Beginning of April 2018, students of the Oregon Culinary Institute are bustling in the neat restaurant of their institute, designed to seat 50 guests. Despite the fact that on the emblem of their culinary school there is a huge cleaver, as if taken from a horror movie poster, this place is still comfortable and safe. The institute is a private, commercial and professional school. It offers the master programs in culinary arts, baking and confectionery art. To get local ingredients, the institute partners with farmers, ranchers and fishermen. The institute's programs are taught in the Goose Hollow neighborhood in southwest Portland on a campus of almost a hundred square meters. The campus includes lecture classes, a recreation room, kitchens and a restaurant which is open from Monday to Friday. Young people practice the skills they gained in the classes by preparing lunch for people. Louis Armstrong is playing in the background from the speakers as students in white uniforms are carefully serving salad and a tenderly pan-fried cod. A waiter student is offering guests to try the chocolate cake for dessert while instructor Daniel Brophy is handing out orders and giving the instructions helping to prepare and serve each dish. Fish, fish, he says. Table five. Chef Brophy is a strict but fair teacher, a person who delivers a motivational speech on the first day of each semester, warning students against whistling or grinning in the kitchen. A smile can ruin a meal, he says. He is always very serious, at least at first glance. Later, during the academic year, more than once he will go hiking with his students to the forest for mushrooms or to the ocean shore to dig up shellfish. Daniel Brophy arrived at the Oregon Culinary Institute on the morning on June 2, 2018 to hold his usual classes. It was a cool Saturday, but the school for aspiring chefs offered weekend courses. Brophy had been working here since 2006, from the very day of the foundation of the school. He had been using a kitchen knife for 12 years as a leading chef instructor. On the left breast of his black uniform there was his name, embroidered in white italics. Chef Brophy. At 7.21 that morning, turning off the institute's security system, the chef was alone. Dorothy Sadie Damon, a colleague, soon arrived. She entered the building just some 10 minutes later at 7.30 in the morning and opened the doors for students at 8. It was strange, because it was Chef Brophy who usually opened the door, as he always came first. It was them, just arrived students, 
who found her teacher lying on the floor. One of the students, Kathleen Dooley, called 911. Maddox hurried to the scene. Another student, Clarinda Paris, tried to give rescue breathing to Brophy. Paris was later telling about it, sobbing. His chest was really squishy, like he had broken a rib, because as he continued to do compressions, it was like everything was filled with blood. The girl continued to perform CPR until doctors arrived. Gray Galt was in chef at the Portland Fire Bureau's Emergency Operations Division. He and his team arrived at the scene. Since the patient was unresponsive, they started CPR. When paramedics cut open Chef Brophy's shirt to apply quick defibrillation patches, Galt noticed a scratch on his chest. At first, the medic decided that it was just a flash wound with a small spot of blood, as it sometimes happens with penetrating wounds. Something passes through the skin, and the edges of the wound close again. Galt didn't realize they were at the crime scene until he moved one of the chef Ruffy's hands to apply a tourniquet. Under it, he saw a spent cartridge. At that moment, Galt understood that the reason for chef Ruffy's condition was most likely a much deeper penetrating wound, and they could no longer revive the victim. That was when they stopped trying. It was too late. Another rescuer found the second cartridge case and put it at the table along the chef Brophy's glasses and watch. Gold and all the members of his team were wearing gloves at the time and didn't leave fingerprints on the evidence. Realizing that they were at the crime scene, Gold dialed code 3 so that the police would arrive as soon as possible. In his call, he explained that there were a lot of people around and he wasn't sure if the shooter was in the building or had already left. The fire brigade imposed a kind of quarantine on the campus until the police arrival. Dan Brophy was shot twice. The first shot was in the back, the second in the chest, at close range when he was lying helpless on the floor. The first bullet pierced the spine and hit the heart. The second also hit the heart. Both wounds were fatal. No weapons were found at the crime scene. Apparently, Chef Brophy was standing with his back to the door near the sink, filling buckets with water and ice to make coffee for the students who were about to come. There was an ice shovel in the corner, which the chef was using when the first bullet hit him. The police immediately cordoned off the crime scene fenced it with the yellow tape and captured the crime scene on video. Detectives Anthony Merrill and Darren Posey from the Portland Police Department took over the case. At first, I thought someone went in there, saw an opportunity to sell a wallet, maybe cash, maybe a car, Detective Anthony Merrill said. But we didn't find any evidence. Uh, it didn't look like a robbery. The victim still had his wallet cell phone and keys, and his 2010 Toyota Tacoma pickup truck was parked outside. It looked like it was a professional killer who quickly entered, committed a murder and uh, left just as soon as possible. Detectives checked to see if anything was missing from the room. With the help of the culinary school's inventory list, they came to the conclusion that no one had touched the shelves with liqueurs and other alcohol, and apparently nothing of the expensive kitchen equipment had been taken. There were no signs of a struggle. There was also no break-in, and the door of the garage where the groceries were delivered stayed open. The killer could easily enter the room through the door after the chef had turned off the alarm. There were no internal or external surveillance cameras at the culinary school, and the camera on the nearby Lincoln High School football pitch was not working. The detectives arrived at the scene. Right after that, around 11 o'clock, the chef's wife Nancy appeared. The officers had to inform her about her husband's death. They recorded the conversation. Officer Cassandra Wells was standing next to Nancy when the latter was informed of her husband's death. Nancy? immediately hung on to her in tears. 
Nat's reactions to the police statement raises some questions. She says that she guessed about her husband's death from the sad looks of others. The first reaction should be denial and disbelief in what is happening, right? Policemen were everywhere. Someone was shot at, everyone was with a serious face, the husband still wasn't answering, but still there must have been hope that it wasn't him. But Nancy was surprisingly quick to accept everything as it was. And the first thing the grief-stricken wife focuses on is that it doesn't matter to her whether the killer will be found or not. It doesn't seem like the usual reaction of a person who has just been robbed of a loved one. Wouldn't anyone else in her place want to just punishment, retribution for the killer or at least find out the motive? But no, she says even if you find them, it doesn't matter, I don't care. It seems to lead away, at least from the fact that there is a culprit. But what kind of reason did Nancy have to come to her husband's work? The police were surprised to see her. It turned out that Maxine, who had been teaching with Dan at the Oregon Culinary Institute for several years, saw the campus on the TV news and tried to call Chef Brophy, but not to avail. Then she decided to call his wife. Nancy replied that she would go to the institute to see what was going on. But she didn't hurry. Instead, she called her husband just twice, sent him one message, and dialed the number of Karen Brophy, Dan's mother. Karen didn't know yet that her son had just been shot. It was an ordinary Nancy calm as usual. It wasn't like she was panicking, Karen Brophy recalled in court. Karen, in turn, began to pursue Nancy to go and see what was happening in the Institute. Nancy reluctantly agreed. During the next phone conversation, Karen heard from a crying Nancy that it was Dan. The woman was so shocked with her son's death that she wasn't able to recall the continuation of this conversation later. She later told the news to Nathaniel, Dan's son. Nancy told the police she was at home that morning. Oh no, she wouldn't think of anyone who wanted to hurt her husband. And no, he had no enemies. The police began to suspect Nancy within a few hours after the discovery of her husband's body. Detectives did find traffic camera footage that recorded a Toyota Sienna minivan similar to Nancy's car, moving west to Jefferson Street right in front of the Institute at 7.08 a.m. At 7.21, Dan turned off the alarm. At 7.28, the surveillance camera again spotted this car on Jefferson Street, but now the car was moving in the opposite direction. In total, everything happened in a six-minute time window. The chef was alone and then killed. If it hadn't been Saturday, but any other weekday, Brophy wouldn't have been alone for a single minute since arriving at the Institute. How could someone else know this and calculate the time so perfectly? Detectives were trying to locate Nancy and according to information from the cell tower, her mobile phone remained at home until about 10.20 in the morning, when she went to the Institute to see what was going on. If she committed a crime, she knew that it was better not to take a mobile phone with her. The police were developing other versions. Maybe it was a dissatisfied with an assessment student or a person by tramp. Surveillance footage showed to the detectives a man who was carrying a trash can near the institute. The man turned out to be Sam Oscar Taylor, so the detectives found and interrogated him. Taylor was involved in a conflict situation that occurred in a neighbor-boring non-profit organization on the same day. However, the detectives excluded Taylor from the list of suspects because the video showed him leaving the institute at the moment of the crime he was too far from the culinary school. Detective Merrill and his colleagues spent several days at the institute continuing their investigation, but not a single student, teacher or witness pointed to Taylor. This clue didn't lead to anything. There were other people caught on camera that morning, but the police couldn't identify or contact them. I felt like we had wound up extra kilometers in this investigation. We're off our feet, Detective Merrill said. We're looking for information about anyone and everyone. But Nancy remained the main suspect. The next day, Nancy posted online about the death of her husband and best friend, not her priority in the post. She mentioned her Facebook friends before her family. After she gave the sad news, she focused on herself, 
close to me, I'm struggling, I appreciate, I'm overwhelmed, and I can function. The day after her husband's murder, she felt the need to add Beth's friend and chef to his name. These words are unnecessary, but she felt the need to clarify that he was not only her husband, he was her best friend, too. That she respected his role as chef and appreciated her spouse. Her linguistic disposition towards the killer is neutral. She writes was killed instead of, for example, the more emotionally colored, someone killed my husband, someone took him away from me. Moreover, judging by the message, she believed that since her husband was killed, she had the right not only to answer the phone or not to call anybody, but also the right not to give any comments on the web. Apparently, the reason for her words was her need to ingratiate herself with her Facebook friends and family, and to rid herself of unwanted phone conversations. On June 5, 2018, students at the Oregon Culinary Institute were holding a candlelight vigil in memory of Dan Ruffy, so Nancy joined students, colleagues and friends. Many people left bouquets in the school parking lot that night. Candles were flickering next to the portrait of the teacher. In the portrait, Dan is standing, looking at the camera with a serious facial expression and holding a rooster with red feathers. Jack Brophy, Dan's father, reminisced how his son helped feed the homeless at the First Baptist Church. He has been a do-gooder all his life, he told the audience. Everyone had a chance to redeem himself in Brophy's eyes. A former student, Zach, still sat. He was never heartless, he was never cruel, he was a sweet man, and he didn't deserve what happened to him. The circle gathered around the Institute's co-founder, Brian Wilkie, who brought funny hats, helmets, and sombreros. Chef Ruffy forced students to wear these hats if they forgot to bring their chef hats. Students cried and laughed shout out over each other, remembering the funny expressions of their teacher, which they named Brophisms. Here are some of them. Every mushroom is edible, once. Every time you burn bacon, an angel gets herpes. You can heal a hand with a shovel. It wouldn't take so long if you didn't do it so slowly. In the silence that followed, Wilkie dressed in the black chef's jacket and a black apron took a propane burner, which Dan called Dragon, and directed the flame into the sky. Everyone applauded. Dan was one of the few people I've ever known who did exactly what he wanted in life and loved doing it, Nancy told to hundreds of people gathered in the school parking lot. She was dressed in black, her glasses were hanging on a string of beads around her neck. He was a person who did what he loved. He loved teaching, he loved mushrooms, he loved, he loved his family. He loved. Not only was life a science experiment, but sometimes it was an adventure. She called him by name, but then, for some reason, just personalized him, calling him not even my husband, but a man, and then continued speaking about him in the same way. Nancy was again seeking sympathy, just like in her Facebook post. When she says, he loved teaching, he loved mushrooms, he loved his family, she speaks about his priority, or more correctly, of her idea of his priority. That is, in her opinion, he loved teaching and mushrooms more than his family. This is subtle victim blaming. The students and teachers of Oregon Culinary Institute were scared. Their teacher was shot and left to die. It became quiet in the culinary school, everyone felt uncomfortable because of what had happened. And that was the day before graduation ceremonies. It will be the first graduation without their chef instructor, Daniel Brophy, since the foundation of the school in 2006. Linda, who lived next door to the Brophys, was standing at the back of the crowd that evening. The next day in Beaverton, when she saw Nancy walking her dogs, two Shih Tzu named PB and J, a neighbor came up and hugged her. I just can't wrap my head around it, Nancy said. It seemed that she was shocked. It was hard for her, another neighbor recalled, after she and her children had knocked on Nancy's door to offer their condolences to the recent widow. On June 5, three days after Dan's murder, 
Nancy called Detective Duran Posey and asked to provide a letter that would confirm her not being a crime suspect. The detective was surprised because such action wasn't stipulated in police practice, so he wondered why she needed such a letter. According to Brophy, she was the beneficiary of a $40,000 life insurance policy and wanted to assure the company that she was above suspicion. But the detective didn't give the letter since Nancy was the suspect. In fact, there were no others. At that time, the police didn't yet know that the amount claimed by Nancy was not 40, but hundreds of thousands of dollars. As the weeks passed, Nancy started talking about moving. She shared with another neighbor that she was haunted by heavy thoughts when she was looking into the bedroom where Dan used to live. She was upset by her thoughts of him so much that she wanted to run away from home. But later, the couple's neighbor Dawn said that Nancy didn't seem broken. I would say she seemed relieved, he said, as if what happened was almost a gift from God. In the summer, Dawn means in his words, asked Nancy how the investigation was progressing and if the police were in touch with her. She replied, no, I am beyond suspicion. And Dawn thought that she must be a very strong woman to handle everything so courageously. Detectives arrived to search Brophy's house in the southwest part of Beaverton and began photographing Nancy's car. She gave them the third degree. Why? Why are you doing it? It wasn't there that morning. But the detectives already knew that this wasn't true. Three months later, on September 5, 2018, Portland police officers took Nancy into custody. Are you arresting me? Brophy asked as the handcuffs were placed on her wrists. You must be thinking that I killed my husband. How witty Nancy! Nancy and Dan had been together for 27 years, almost half of his life. He was 63 years old and she was almost 68. Like all marriages, we have had our ups and downs, more good times than bad, Nancy wrote about their relationship. Nancy Lake Rampton was born in Wichita Falls, Texas and was the middle child in a family of two lawyers. In 1968, Nancy graduated from high school and entered the University of Houston, where she studied economics. In 1991, she moved from Texas to Oregon and enrolled at the Western Culinary Institute in Portland, which was later renamed in the Lee Cordon Blue College of Culinary Arts. There she met a teacher, Daniel Brophy. They had been friends for a while before starting a romantic relationship. Nancy studied and, according to her friend and roommate, didn't attach great importance to their relationship. Nancy graduated from the university and started a business in providing catering services, and suddenly all the friends received an invitation to the wedding. The magnificent celebration took place in 1999, but in fact, Dan and Nancy legally registered their marriage only on June 14, 2016. It's common for some states. Couples often arrange a ceremony without an official marriage and vice versa. Nancy described the beginning of their relationship. I can't tell you when I fell in love with my husband, but I will tell you about the moment when I decided to marry him. I was in the bath. It was a big tube. I expected him to join me, and when he was delayed, I called, Are you coming? His answer convinced me that he was Mr. Wright. Yes, I'm making our devoir. Can you imagine spending the rest of your life without a man like that? By describing this scene, Nancy hints to others that her husband's priority was always cooking, even at the beginning of their relationship. Romantic, intimate, atmosphere, anticipation, and here the girl is sitting alone in the cooling bath, because her beloved person, instead of keeping her company, is preparing snacks. For Dan, this was his second marriage. He had a son, Nathaniel, from the first marriage, who lived separately with his own family. For Nancy, marriage was also not the first. Her previous chosen one was a policeman. Dan and Nancy lived in the house called Blue Beaverton. A paved path led to the front door of the house, and there was plenty of room for breakfast chickens and turkeys, and for his garden on a plot of 2,000 square meters. The house had wooden floors and walled ceilings. In one of the rooms, Nancy tapped out another scene of the keyboard full of intrigue, forbidden passion and adventures. 
and from the kitchen the light clatter of a knife and the clink of dishes were heard. The chef and owner of the house was working there. Nancy and Dan had been living together in this place for 22 years. Nancy herself described their life like this. I live in the beautiful green and very humid northwest, married to the chef whose mantra was life is a scientific project. As a result, there are chickens and turkeys in my backyard, a fabulous vegetable garden which also grows tobacco for an insecticide and a hot meal on the table every night. For those of you who have longed for this, let me caution you. The old adage is true. Be careful what you wish for. When the gods are truly angry, they grant us our wishes. And the payment is always high. I fight an insidious 10 pounds every year of my life. Nancy loved writing. The first work published by her was a pamphlet for the University of Houston entitled Between Your Navel and Your Knees. It covered the subject of the changing mores of sexuality in the 1960s and 1970s. She also wrote for trade magazines and recruitment departments. By the time of the events described, Nancy Brophy considered herself a writer of romantic suspense. She wrote passionate, convoluted novels about women in trouble and men eager to help. In 2003, Nancy Brophy joined the chapter of Romance Writers of America and presented the following description of herself on the website. Writers are liars. I don't remember who said it, but it's not true. In writing fiction, you dig deep and unearth portions of your own life that you've long forgotten or buried. Of course, sometimes the more reasonable decision is to change the ending. Anyway, let me add that this photo is a lie. I haven't looked like this for a long time, but it's me. Nancy described her works and her personal life. My imaginary friends have reached larger than life lives encompassed in a few hundred page with definite beginnings, snappy middles, and above all, happy endings. My personal life is never as clearly defined. Beginnings are hard to locate. A new job, a school term, a family event like a death or a wedding might signal the start of something new, but it's never heralded with any fanfare or another link in the chain. Brophy was both a writer, publisher, and editor, so her books didn't meet high artistic merit. They came out with typos and mistakes, but nevertheless, they were suitable for light reading and they even have fans. My stories are about pretty men and strong women, about families that don't always work and about the joy of finding love and the difficulty of making it stay. This is how the author herself defined them. In 2015, Nancy Brophy wrote a series of novels entitled The Wrong Series, The Wrong Brother, The Wrong Cop, The Wrong Hero, The Wrong Lover, The Wrong Husband, The Wrong Seal. Well, you get the gist. Take a look at the covers of her books. Her friends helped to make them. The slogan, Ron never felt so right, is supposed to intrigue. Sometimes it seems that her characters speak in author's own voice, of a woman over 60. Oh lord, a beautiful 33-year-old blonde thinks trying to flirt for the first time since high school. Nuts. She cursed her love interest, a former Navi seal. Just the sound of his rough, erasual, laden voice had her sex clenching. By a lifetime of experience screamed, danger, danger, danger. In this novel, a woman falls in love with a former Navy SEAL who helps her escape from an abusive husband who wants to kill her. The reason is a life insurance policy in her name worth several million dollars. In the book, her husband commits suicide. The heroine sees him lying, crumpled in the head on the floor. A lumpy red splatter of blood oozes down the wall. It's easy to project assumptions about what happened at the Oregon Culinary Institute onto Nancy's work. My mother used to say, never put anything in writing you will have to defend in court. Brophy confessed in the book Plotting Your Story Arc, but Nancy apparently failed to heed her mother's wise advice. In November 2011, long before she was charged with murder, Crampton Brophy speculated on the perfect way to kill in a scathing essay titled How to Murder Your Husband. In the essay, 
Ruffy admits that as the romantic suspense writer, she spends a lot of time thinking about murder and consequently about police procedure. At the beginning of the essay, she shamelessly speaks on her own behalf and seems to be talking about herself. If the murder is supposed to set me free, I certainly don't want to spend any time in jail. And let me say clearly for the second, I don't like jumpsuits and orange isn't my color. Further, in an ironic tone, she expounds the reasoning of a woman who wants to kill her husband. Breath lists the motives for the murder, and the first is financial. This is big. Divorce is expensive, and do you really want to split your possession? Maybe he is cheating? Or maybe he fell in love with someone else and so on? Here, Brophy discusses methods of murder and types of weapons. Guns, loud, messy, requires some skill. If it takes 10 shots for the sucker to die, either you have a terrible aim or he is on drugs. Next come knives, garrots, poison and hiring a hitman. At the end she writes, I find it easier to wish people dead than to actually kill them. I don't want to worry about blood and brains splattered on my walls, and really, I'm not good at remembering lies. But the thing I knew about murder is that every one of us has it in him or herself when pushed far enough. Nancy, in the same black humor in 2011, wrote about her and Dan's marriage. We vowed prior to saying I do that we wouldn't end in a divorce. We didn't. I should not. Rule out a tragic drive by shooting or a suspicious accident. In an interview in 2012, Brophy gave an interview to the Romance Stories blog. Murder, mayhem and gore seem to come naturally to me. Which means my husband has learned to sleep with one eye open. Probably killing her husband has been her obsession for many years. And it was very likely caused by finance and Nancy's life use. Here is her 2015 essay. Consider the lilies, how they grow, they don't toil, neither do they spin, Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory wasn't arrayed like one of these. I've always loved that idea that it is possible to exist without toil and worry, but in my life I've never found it to be true. For years I had a different quote hanging in my office. The middle of anything always looks like failure, which was to remind myself that while I continually seek instant gratification, it is more important to be working than to sit idle hoping good things will come. Because I am a selfish being, sometimes when good happens I don't take the time to celebrate, instead I look ahead like a small child at Christmas eager for the next present. And so the selfish being rides a roller coaster of emotions from ups to downs and back and dreams of a life without hard work and worry. In another essay, Nancy identifies herself with a king troll from Frozen who has mushrooms growing on his back, because her lifestyle is too sedentary. Brophy described what her perfect day should include – a good book, a cup of a hot chocolate and a fairy godmother. Who would clean the house instead of Nancy? But her husband, Dan, led a completely different style – active, real and down-to-earth. Dan Brophy was born in June 27, 1954. As you probably already guessed, Dan's main hobby was culinary. It was his job, his passion, his love. That's how he taught his students. Cooking is a way to express love. Dan has more than 40 years of experience as a chef, including working in 24-hour restaurants. He was a teacher and a true gourmet. Students considered Chef Brophy cool. He could be strict and he could be straightforward. He wasn't afraid to have conversations that many instructors might shy away from, such as if culinary school was right for you or not, the students said. Brophy treated all students equally, he didn't divide them into favorites and losers. As the faculty elder, he had encyclopedic knowledge honed in the kitchen and the fields. His whole life Chef Brophy was studying new techniques and recipes. He taught his students not only how to cook, but also how to raise pigs and find fresh produce on local farms. He was an ingenious gardener and a marine biologist. At home he raised chickens, 
hands and turkeys more than 40 pieces. Grow vegetables, according to the chef himself, he grew 150 different types of vegetables in 35 years, and even bred bees. By the way, Dan's beloved chickens instantly disappeared from Blue Beaverton's yard after his death. On weekends, to help young people learn more about the profession, Brophy held outdoor classes. They had different thematic classes, from mushroom picking to learning how to grow a proper chicken. Brophy changed students' views on food, on its meaning and value. In addition to a sombrero of those who forgot their chef hat, Brophy started a tradition according to which every year one of the students would wear a cow outfit sewn by Nancy so that the others would velcro the names of various pieces of meat carcasses onto the outfits. He used to participate in students' discussions in the school's hallways and he joked a lot. He used to have a morbid sense of humor at times. For example, he kept a tip jar to collect pieces of fingers cut off by students while chopping food at classes. If you cut off the tip of your finger, it belonged to him the chef's students recalled. The students knew Brophy's wife well. He was a chef, and she was manager, as he heartily called her in his classes. When it came to the next trip for mushrooms or to the sea, he said, I'd better negotiate with my manager, or I will consult with the manager, referring to his wife. Linda, Brophy's neighbor, said that it seemed Dan and Nancy really fit each other. Once Dan brought a pumpkin pie to Linda on Thanksgiving Day, and sometimes Nancy would call in on her with cookies. And it was pretty friendly, though quieter than his wife. They just seemed really in love, and even if they had difficulties, their spouses never followed their own nest. There were no signs of strife in the marriage as I could see, said retired chef Randall Crownell, who worked with Daniel for almost three decades. When he saw them together, you would think they were the perfect couple. They were so loving and so funny, they laughed more than any two people I've never known, adds Tony Hall, the restaurant management instructor at the culinary school, who knew the brothers well. Nancy was friendly, bubbly, witty. I never saw my dissatisfaction in their marriage. They didn't even, even seem frustrated with each other like you see with most people in a long marriage. The last time Chef Brophy and his wife were seen was when they were having lunch at the famous Higgins restaurant in the city center. He came in carrying a jar of pickles that he had grown and cooked for the restaurant and said hi when he spotted his former student. On September 17, 2018, being charged with murder, Nancy Brophy pleaded not guilty and stated that she had no reason to kill Daniel and the murder was committed by some stranger. I have flaws, Dan had flaws, Nancy said, but together we have become a good team. The defense insisted on the version of a robbery gun wrong. On Monday, on the first day of Brophy's murder trial, the judge ruled that it would be unfair if the prosecution mentioned her 2011 essay since it may cause prejudice. And although the judge excluded the incriminating essays from the trial, the prosecutor quoted it without mentioning the name. Oh, those legal loopholes. Brophy said about her essay that the editor would not have accepted such a story. In her opinion, he would laugh and say, I think you need to work harder on this story. He had a big hole in it. It's like Nancy's alibi. Nancy was getting confused in her explanations about her whereabouts at the time of the murder. Apparently, she was really not good at remembering lies. She said that at the day of the murder, she was in bed when her husband left for work. Shortly after, she took a shower, but no sooner had she found out that her car was recorded by video cameras. Then she said that she must have gone out to grab some coffee and then she returned home to continue writing. She simply forgot about the above facts. Suddenly she announced to have memory loss that occurred due to the shock she had received by hearing the news of her husband's death. Under cross-examination, Nancy said that she went for a drive in search of inspiration for her books. She couldn't recollect exactly where she was, but she said, I know 
I didn't go into the building because he didn't kill Dan. I know that for a fact. Ruffy's neighbor, Hedy Hutchinson, saw Nancy in her car on the morning of the murder. Nancy slowed down and wondered if she had seen their missing dogs. Hutchison found this stretch, since they had looked for dogs together before but had never did it by car. Usually the puppies didn't run far away. Nancy and Hedy took the leashes and looked for them into the backyard and in the garden since there was no fence. It was not quite usual to go somewhere in search of dogs in the early morning. Of course, the car in the surveillance camera's footage resembled her car. But was it really her car? Bus service, light rail and commuter rail service in Portland, Oregon is provided by TriMet. It also conducts video surveillance at transit city interchanges. In July 2018, an officer taking part in the investigation of Daniel's murder contacted a representative of the company and asked him to look for a video from the morning of June 2, which captured a great Toyota Sienna minivan in the Goose Hollow area. Dachi, who was responsible for the video, found the footage and zoomed in on the frame, where it was possible to read the license plate. He managed to decipher the first three digits, 067. He was sure the first letter was B, but he doubted about the second and third letters. The detective received a list of all the 2004-2005 Toyota Sienna minivans in the state from the Department of Motor Vehicles. This is the car brand, model and year of manufacture of the car that Nancy Brophy owned that time. By the way, she drove it to the Institute campus on the morning of the murder. The list included 21 cars. The list was reduced to 12. Only two of those were of the same color as the Brophy's van. None of them had rims that matched the rims of the surveillance video recorded near the crime scene, and none of them had license plates that would match Brofus' license plates. No one except Nancy's own car, 067BQX. The footage spotted the same scratch as in the photo of Nancy's car, and also a white parking sticker in the lower corner of the windscreen. Two case cartridges which were found at the scene were checked for fingerprints with the help of a standard procedure. They were placed in cyanoacrylate fuming chamber. In the chamber, the super glue heads up and releases vapors that stick to substances secreted by the fingers, such as sebaceous oils, proteins, as well as the remains of lotions, creams or food. Fingerprints can leave behind a so-called comb, but the criminalist said that in 14 years of practice she had never recovered a readable fingerprint from a shell casing that could identify a criminal. The shell cases found near Chef Brophy's body were no exception, a comb was not enough to identify the fingerprint. Checking the shell casings for touch DNA is not included in the standard procedure since the chances of finding bits of DNA there are too slim. The analysis conducted by the Oregon State Forensic Lab showed that the bullets extracted from Dan's body were most likely fired from a Glock 9mm self-loading pistol. Nancy confessed to detectives she had recently purchased the firearm, although she said that neither she nor her husband had never used a pistol or bought cartridges. After the criminalist examined the weapon, the medical examiner determined that most likely it was not the same gun that killed Dan. But everything wasn't so simple. Dan was not a gun nut and he never planned to buy a gun, but Nancy shared with some friends her desire to buy a firearm about a year before her husband's death. She bought a gun as a bleak kid online on Christmas Eve 2017. It was the cruelest irony that in January 2018 Dan Brophy himself signed for it, since his wife was traveling for work. Nancy wanted to make a so-called ghost gun, a weapon that is impossible to trace. The firearm parts of the ghost gun were parts of the Glock 19 pistol, but Nancy overestimated her skills and simply couldn't assemble the gun from separate parts. Then she bought another gun, Glock 17 handgun, and the gun show in Portland where she and her husband went in February 2018. One month later, she began practicing at a shooting range entrance, which didn't require an identify check. The Glock 17, which Brophy bought at the gun show, differed from the 19th version of a gun only by a longer slide and longer grip. 
So Nancy swapped the barrel of the gun bought at the gun show with an identical mechanism bought online. This fact didn't allow forensic examiners to compare the shell casings with the original gun slide. Perhaps Nancy then swapped the slide and barrel, the ones from the gas gun kit, with the original details, but she failed to install them on the gun frame and fix. Detectives found evidence on the purchase of gas gun parts, but never found the slide and barrel, which in their opinion were used in the shooting. A few days after the murder, Nancy deleted her account in an online store. She spent almost 1500 to buy the Glock and parts for it. The defense attorneys insisted that Nancy bought the guns as a search for her books. According to the plot, the heroine assembles the gun on her own and the novelist wanted to put it into practice to describe it in the novel. It should be noted that, as a writer, she quite frequently bought various items for inspiration. Antique wooden handles, real police handcuffs, a night vision device, a telescope. Also, according to the fans, Brophy allegedly purchased a weapon for self-defense because she was concerned about Parkland High School shooting in Florida. When asked why she never told the police about buying a ghost gun, the details of which the investigators found, Nancy said, A weapon assembly kit could be evidence? I'm asking because I don't think so. Nancy spent money not only on things to indulge her inner child. Dad's parents Jack and Karen helped the family financially. About 10 years before Dan's death, his parents gave Nancy a $50,000 loan to help her open a sandwich shop, but the business didn't bring the expected income. The couple returned about a quarter of the amount, and eventually Jack and Karen forgave them the debt. In 2014, the Brophy couple began struggling financially. In November 2017, Daniel had to take out $35,000 from his retirement account to catch up on his mortgage and credit card debts. They were still failing $6,000 behind in mortgage repayments. But Nancy Brophy secretly paid more than $16,000 premiums in her husband's life insurance policies. She said it was an investment in her and her husband's financial future. Although, it would be more correct to say that she was investing in her future. Dan's parents gave Daniel and Nancy $2,000 and their own Toyota minivan after Nancy's Prius disappeared. Nancy told Jack that she sold the Prius to a friend, but he later found out that this wasn't true. Only Nancy knows where the car was gone. Although, in 2017, they had financial difficulties. Dan planned to retire. He decided to conduct weekend classes in addition to his usual weekday classes at the Culinary Institute. He also took a part-time job as a cook at a rehabilitation center. As a result, Brophy significantly reduced the debt on their credit cards and mortgage payments, and by June 2018, the couple's financial situations had improved significantly. They even managed to save up a family capital. But Nancy, in contrast to her husband, wanted more than just peaceful retirement. At some point, she suddenly had the idea to sell the house and spend the money on traveling around the world. Apparently, Nancy decided to catch up the time she had lived in the household routine and financial constraints. She pushed her husband to sell and complain to friends that Dan wouldn't be easy to convince to follow her plans. Although Dan once solely owned their house in Beaverton, in 2017 he transferred the deed to both his nan's names. But he didn't settle for selling the house and for the around-the-world trip. For Chef Brophy, the achievements in life were not a glass of wine at the French Riviera, not a visit to a casino in Las Vegas, but his wife, son and grandchildren, vegetables in the garden, chickens and a favorite hobby. He was passionate about his business, quite happy with life and didn't even share financial problems with his son. Dan liked their house and he was happy to stay in it forever. Obviously, it was then, after 27 years of family life, that Nancy seriously started thinking of spending the rest of her life without Daniel but with a large bank account. Nancy started convincing her mother-in-law, Karen, that Dan had changed, that supposedly all he wanted to do was lie on the couch and watch a sports channel, but Karen found her words strange because her son had never been to sports. 
Dan's father, Jack, said he believed that Nancy and Dan slept in separate bedrooms. Nancy talked about selling the house even before Dan's death, and then she jumped through the hops trying to sell the house before the bank realized that the only person who paid the mortgage had died, so, so the bank could demand a full payment. In addition to writing bad novels, Nancy Brophy had another occupation. She sold life and health insurance policies and charged several insurance companies. She issued several policies in every new insurance company in order to demonstrate her faith in their insurance. The number of policies grew also because she earned fees for the policies sold. Therefore, in order to earn money, she sold policies to herself. Nancy became the sole beneficiary of more than 10 life insurance policies worth $1.4 million. Together with compensation payments, this amount reached $1.5 million. Brophy claimed compensation because her husband died at work. Nancy Brophy planned and carried out what she believed was the perfect murder. A murder that she believed would free her from the clutches of financial despair and allow her to start a life full of wealth and adventure, which she described in her potboilers. But instead, Nancy Lee Crapton Brophy was awaiting sentencing at the Multnomah County Jail in Portland, Oregon. In May 2022, in court, she took the defense witness set and got into serious battle with the prosecutor. Brophy testified that she didn't remember any of the events and had happened to her during the time frame of the crime due to a retrograde amnesia attack, which appeared after the traumatic news of her husband's death. Nancy tried to portray noble indignation in response to their accusations, but it looked more like arrogant, angry attacks on the prosecutor. Specialists in the field of psychiatry examined Crabbe and Bruffy using the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Test. The results showed that Nancy is independent in solving her problems, not too emotional and tends to be manipulative, but no signs of psychopathy were revealed. Her memory issues were nothing more than attempts to cover up the lie. I'm not lying, that's how my brain works. The experts noted how incredibly selective her amnesia was. That's a claim that she had never held a gun in her hands. However, her browser history contained the following search. How to load a Glock. Perhaps she wanted to charge it with her love and care. She also watched a video of how to remove the slide and barrel from the Glock, but claimed that she hadn't touched the gun because the weapon was heavy and disgusting. In her and Daniel's shared iTunes account, there was found a bookmark, 10 ways to cover up a murder. In September 2018, 71-year-old Nancy Crampton Brophy accidentally let sleep to a cellmate, Andrea B. Jacobs, convicted of fraud that she shot her husband. In prison, Brophy and Jacobs became friends in some way. Their bunks were next to each other and they began to stick together. One day, Brophy shouted and read an article from People magazine. It was about her husband's murder. And she said that she didn't have to worry about the murderer to be found, but about proving herself being innocent. To Andrea's questions about how her husband died, Nancy started a sentence with I, but it quickly stopped. She told a friend that Dan had been shot twice to the heart, but then Brophy spread her arms to the sides and said, It was about this far. Wow, that's pretty close, Jacobs responded. Prison officials intercepted the mention of this confession through Andrew's correspondence. Jacobs herself was stunned that they decided to involve her as a witness because she didn't want to be a snitch and was also intimidated by threats from her cellmates. However, she testified in court. No one had any doubts about the suspect's guilt, and on May 25, 2022, Nancy Crampton Brophy was found guilty of second-degree murder for the death of her husband, and on June 13, 2022, the 71 year old amateur novelist was sentenced to life imprisonment. Nancy was standing quietly covering her nose and mouth with a medical mask while she was being sentenced. In theory, she can be released on parole in 25 years, but most likely, Brophy will spend the rest of her life in prison. 
Braffy's lawyers sought her release from arrest. They proposed that she stay in a guest house under GPS monitoring and a 24-hour curfew in Portland because of concerns about the coronavirus. They relied on her age and the diagnosis, diabetes, as well as on the improving conditions in prison as the reasons for alternative imprisonment. But their request was declined. Today, Nancy is serving her sentence at the Coffee Creek Correctional Facility in Wilsonsville, Oregon. Then's son, Nathaniel Stillwater, filed a civil lawsuit against Nancy and also launched a fight with her in court over his father's property. Usually in Oregon, the surviving spouse becomes the sole owner of the common property. But the so-called Son of Sam laws are designed to keep criminals from profiting from their crimes. By the end of the winter 2022, Nancy and Dan's Blue Beaverton house was put up for sale. Nancy didn't get anything. Before Crampton Brophy was sentenced to life in prison, Nathaniel turned to her in court. Perhaps no one has ever given a better description of Nancy and the whole story. You're a monster. You opted to lie, steal, cheat. You ultimately killed the man that was for some reason still unbeknownst to me, your biggest fan. You executed my father in an act of cold-blooded, premeditated murder. The man that did everything for you. Cooked your meals, washed your clothes, accepted your sedentary nature, supported your failed endeavors, and brought you into the warm embrace of our family. Your payment for decades of dedication, trust, and love plot his murder on Christmas Eve while in the presence of his parents and grandchildren. Former students of the now-defunct Oregon Culinary Institute reminisce Chef Daniel Brophy as an amazing teacher and as a human being as a whole. Brophy's death and the subsequent murder trial drew the attention of the entire country. But for people who knew him, he remained a quiet, ironic man and a lover of simple pleasures, loved and respected by everyone without exceptions. The memory of Dan lives in the hearts of his family, colleagues, students, and in his Brophisms. Ironically, Nancy is now more famous than ever before. She believed in her right and talents as much as she believed in her ability to commit the perfect crime. But Crampton Brophy failed in everything. If Nancy had been a good writer, she would have come up with a more plausible lie. But she thought she was brainer than the policeman and everyone else. The writer tried to bring her novels to life and as a result, her reality became as ugly as her writings. Although Daniel Brophy was the only human victim of Nancy Crampton Brophy. She has been distorting storylines and breaking grammar rules for many years, destroying innocent paper, killing characters at the time of her readers. If there was anything Daniel Brophy was guilty of, it was that he supported the literary work of his wife.